So people all over going through all kinds of stuff, and, uh, and it's good to just know that we have a, a family of believers that love one another and pray for one another, and it's, uh, it's good to see you. If you're here, good to be on with you online. If you're online, and uh, man, I was on vacation this week. Y'all don't sound excited about that. It is actually pretty good, you know. Uh, you're like, yeah, well, so, right? Uh, I wasn't, right? That's how I feel when other people come back. I was just on vacation. I'm like, that didn't do me any good, right? So uh, I'm with you. But that's kind of the setup because I want to share with you this morning kind of how my week went. And I know that sounds weird because normally I don't want to come up here and tell you how my week went most weeks because it's not about me. But this morning I wanted to share something because I think... A lot of times when we come to church, we read scripture, we study the text, we look at it in this historical kind of context, and we look at it in this like, yeah, that happened back then, and and we read it like, yeah, that's probably somebody else's thing. And sometimes, though, we have spans of time where we really see scriptures come to life that we've been dealing with recently. And you know if you've been here, if you haven't been here, I'll bring you up to speed. We've been talking a lot about our responsibility as believers to represent Christ in every area. And the more I dig in, the more I read those scriptures, the more I'm convinced that our purpose is not so much as individual as we think it is, as it is to be a representative of the one who saved us. And so... One of the things that happens when you teach, and any of you Bible teachers in here can agree with this and confirm what I'm about to say, is that oftentimes when you teach something in Scripture, the Lord will put you through it so that you can kind of confirm it, not just with this, but with experience. And, and, and I heard a few amens, right? And and it's funny because sometimes I'll say something that might challenge you, and it sounds good, but man, later in the week when the Lord throws it back on me to trust when it's not easy, when he comes back to me that says, love somebody that might not be that lovable, uh, I don't get a pass just because I'm up here talking about it. Usually I get it right on the heels of it, and, and I get to see whether I'm going to walk the talk or whether I'm going to just cave up under some pressure. Well, this week... It wasn't like that. It was actually, uh, it was this really cool time with the Lord where he showed me a great example to share with you about what we're talking about. I know, again, we talk in historical terms. Sometimes we talk in, uh, in parables like Jesus did. So we bring up these hypotheticals or we share stories from books like chicken for the soul or whatever it is. You know, we come up with all these kind of things when we're preaching that feel good and they motivate us. But sometimes we get to do real life with the scriptures right in front of us. And I want to kind of share with you how that worked. I got three scriptures to throw out there to you this morning. But first, I'd love for you to join me in prayer. Would you do that? Lord, I just thank you, God, for the fact that your word is alive and well, and it's working and it's unfolding and it's it's just revealing truth to us each and every day. Father, I pray, God, that as we study your word this morning, God, that not only would it be something that we read, not only would it be something that encourages us, let it be something that unfolds right in front of us in the days to come. I just pray, God, that we would walk as people who are living out your word. Holy Spirit, I pray that you'll be the loudest voice in the room to anybody that's listening to this message. And I ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, I'm going to take you back a uh, week before last when I shared a scripture out of 2 Corinthians chapter 5. It is verse 20, and it goes like this. So we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. For God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. That sounds like a great scripture. And I've, I even shared it with you. Maybe you remember what I said. Maybe you forgot it after you had your french fries. I don't know. Either way, I'll say it again this morning. That what God is saying to us here, what the Apostle Paul wrote, but God is saying to us is that, is that we are the plan that God has to reveal himself to other people. We are. 
And that doesn't mean we, me, and somebody else. That means me and you, if you claim to know Christ. If you follow Christ, if you've been saved, if you're born again, if you're in the family of God, then this means you. And I don't know, maybe I could say it every Sunday before some people started to believe it, but you are God's plan A. Get that. You are. You are. And I know you're thinking, ah, nah, yeah. right? You know how I know you're thinking that? Well, some of you are thinking that because that's what I used to think. Ah, that's for the evangelist, you know? That's for that guy that gets fired up like Pastor Trey, right? Just gets so excited about the gospel. Hey, people listen. They don't listen to me. You know, I'm kind of a monotone, boring kind of preacher guy. Yeah, whatever. That's good. I'll, 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 you know, but man, I think that to lead people to Christ, I used to think that it was all about the energy and the passion, and it is. Because listen to what Paul, he came right on the heels of it, and he said, listen, that we speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. We're speaking for him. When I say to anybody, come back to God, who am I speaking for? Christ, not me. Christ. That that's a message directly from the King of Kings. Come back to him. Not for my benefit, for yours and for his for God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. Very simple. Like the most succinct version of the gospel is right there. It's just right there. That he died for our sins so that we could be made right with the Father in heaven, with God. And he says that when we, when we proclaim that, we're talking for him. Amen? And I was sitting... I, my vacation, I joined, my wife and I joined my family, my sister, my brother-in-law, and my, and my dad. We all went to um, a timeshare down at Hilton Head, um, South Carolina, I think it is. Really beautiful place. We get there. We kind of settle in. We're ready for seven days of sun and stuff, just, you know, nothing, really. That was my plan. My sister said, what do you want to do? I said, nothing. For seven days, that's what I want to do. Nothing. All right, so I started out that way. And just like everybody else, you know, stuff goes on. And we get a call on Tuesday from my wife's family, or my wife gets a call. And her uncle had been taken to the hospital very, very sick. Very, very sick. And I'm gonna, I normally don't preach about people uh, and use their name. I change their name. So I'm not going to change his name. I just want you to just so I can tell it as real as possible without stumbling over my pseudonyms and stuff. But Uncle Willie got sick. Uncle Willie had been sick. He had COPD, breathing problems, stuff like this. Wasn't COVID related, just, just that way. He'd been deteriorating for some time. Went into the hospital, a uh, very proud, tough guy, didn't want to go, but you get to a point, anybody caves in, right? I need some help. And he goes to the hospital, jump forward a couple days, and Uncle Willie passes away. Thursday morning. And so Wednesday, when I heard he was sick, sometimes I'll hear people are sick, and I'm like, it doesn't, doesn't bother me. I mean, it's not that I'm okay with them being sick, but y'all know what I mean. Sometimes you hear somebody's sick, and it's like, oh, that ain't good. And that's how I felt. And so I sat on the balcony. I think a couple people were taking a nap. A couple people had gone shopping. Anyway, it was some time that I was by myself. And I began to ask the Lord, Should I, do I need to go now? Do I need to go and do I need to see Willie? Because I'll use the words that the pastor at the funeral used. He said that Willie wasn't an overly religious fellow. And he wasn't. He's not, you know, he wasn't a churchgoer, wasn't any of that. And I thought, Lord, do I need to get up and go from here right now and go see him and share the gospel with him and make sure he's okay with you for whatever he would face? And I just did not feel like the Lord was saying, get up and go. Maybe that's because I was torn. I was on vacation, man. You know? Is that being too real? Boy, I feel for him. I'm, going, I'm on vacation. Should I go? Should I stay? What's going on here? What, what should I do? And it's like the Lord showed me something in that moment. And he actually brought me back to 2 Corinthians 5 that I preached the week before. And you know what I actually prayed? I said, Lord, I sure hope somebody somewhere has heard that message 
and they're willing to make your appeal to him right where he is. You hearing what I'm saying? I can't be there right now. And I don't know if he'll be alive six hours from now if I drive as fast as I can. And I don't know if I can even get into the hospital to see him. So, Lord, I hope somebody has been listening to what you say about how you make your appeal to men and women through us. Send somebody. Matthew 9, I want to read this account to you in Verse 35, this is, Jesus is alive, he's well, he's doing things, but he teaches his disciples something very important here. He says, it says that Jesus traveled through all the towns and the villages of that area, teaching in the synagogues and announcing the good news about the kingdom. And he healed every kind of disease and illness. And when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were confused and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. And he said to his disciples, the harvest is great, but the workers are few. So pray to the Lord who's in charge of the harvest and ask him to send more workers into his fields. So here's Jesus looking at these people, and he sees that they're helpless. He sees that they're confused, and he has compassion, and he looks at his guys, his friends, and he says, y'all need to pray to the Lord of the harvest. In other words, the one that owns the harvest, the, ones that o- the one that oversees the harvest, the one that is in charge of it, you should pray to him, which was himself, and say, send some workers. Send somebody. Why? It lines up with other scriptures. Jesus came that all men would be saved. All people. Everybody. That he wanted them to hear the good news. In other words, you have to take time to ask the Lord, who's in charge of reaching people, to send people to reach people. I didn't realize it until I started thinking about what I was going to preach about this week, but I did that on that balcony. Lord, send somebody to see Willie. Send somebody. I can't go. And you know when your family, nobody wants to listen to you anyway. Seriously. So we learned that Uncle Willie passed away. We come back. We want to be at the funeral. And I'm heavy-hearted, to be honest with you, because I don't know. You ever, you ever gone to a funeral where you just didn't know? I didn't know. Uh, boy, I really, really rely on the grace of God in those moments. Boy, I sure hope. I didn't know the story. We just got back into town the night before. Here we are at the funeral. And the pastor begins to share about how Willie's son called him. said, hey, can you go talk to Dad? Because I don't know if he'll listen to me, but I just want him to make things right or have the opportunity. And so, as the pastor began to share, the more he shared, the lighter my heart got. Because he began to share about how he went up to the hospital. And he, he had known Willie years before. They knew one another. They just didn't hang out or anything. But he knew him, went and saw him shared the gospel with him, baptized he and his wife in that room. And that's what I wanted to do at the funeral, but no one else did, so I sat there quietly like, yes, you know. And I began to think, I didn't get to talk to him. But this guy's name was Randy, never met him before. What a genuine, man, genuine guy. Just as, you could hear his heart. Just, he just wanted people to know the Lord. He wasn't a, wasn't a loud, wasn't a yelling guy. He was just as real, just a guy you'd love to have coffee with and hang out with and call your friend. But to so many people, I'm sure his benefit over his life, he had taken time to learn the simple message that you too can be right with God. And he shared it, and he shared it in the hospital, and he said that he shared it over and over in the hospital. He's a pastor of a church. He's a hospice pastor, so he works in that arena where people are in their last moments. But, he, but he's sharing something with people that you and I have to learn to share with people, and it's, and it's even possible to do it before they're on their bed in their last moments, guys. See, this is why it's important. This is why I was like, wow. 
because God's showing me this. He said, you know, you're teaching people, you're trying to show people that there's a way that they can introduce people to the gospel, that you can show a simple way for them to show that, that we're removed from God, and, and, and God wants us back, and he made a way through Jesus, and it's not that hard of a thing to figure out. But, but, I, but, but I got to watch how one person who, who knew the story, told the story, to my uncle by marriage, but I really like Willie. He was a good dude. And I'm thankful to that guy who took the time to share the gospel because now I'm, I'm the beneficiary of one of the best gifts that anybody, including you, can leave to people when you leave this world. And that is hope that you'll see them again. That you'll see them glorified no sickness, no problems, no tears in heaven. Why? Because somebody believed what Paul wrote when he said that God is making his appeal through you. See, we want angels to come and do it, and it ain't the angel's job. We want Jesus to come and do it. But it's not his job. He's telling us right there, this is our job. And I get it, and y'all have heard Peter and Jones say it over and over again. It's not because you're scared. It's, not, it's just because a lot of us don't know how to do it. We just don't know how. We didn't take the time. Well, there's a group of people that will meet for their last session, training session, that are today after church. They've been through it. They've practiced it on one another, and they've learned how to tell their story and Jesus' story. And so here's the deal. If you're kind of sitting here and you're going, I don't even know how to tell that story, then you need to get in touch with us, right? Write it down. Info at the Lord's table. Just say, oh, I want to learn how. That's all you need. We'll know what you're talking about, right? Because we can put you in touch with people that can teach you how. Why? Because, because somebody's uncle needs you. Somebody's aunt needs you. Somebody's sister needs you. Somebody's brother, friend, somebody needs you. They need me. They don't need me to preach on Sunday morning because they're not going to hear that. They need, him, need me to meet them at the coffee shop, on the soccer field, at the job site, in the classroom. You know what I mean? Man, I watched this week as God sent a laborer, the Lord of the harvest, sent a worker to harvest the very soul of someone that I love. And I thank the pastor. And I told him, I said, you know, I was sitting on a balcony, beautiful place, looking at trees and the beach and stuff, and I prayed that somebody would go, and you did. And he just kind of smiled, and he goes, well, that's what we do. <laughs> and I thought, man, what if there were 20 or 30 more of us, or 50 more of us, or 500 of more of us. That when people thanked us for sharing, we would just say, well, that's just what we do. Because it's like breathing when you learn it. It's just as simple as talking about any friend that you have, anybody. Guys, we need to grasp this idea that for a lot of people, and I'm telling you, a lot of people are open to the gospel. They're not real keen on church, just so you know, because we do some kooky stuff for real. And they'll go, I'm not interested in church. Yeah, well, how about eternal life? How about being right with God? Well, let, let church worry about that stuff later. When it comes down to it, it's in the eternity is set, the scripture said, in the heart of every person. 
There's something in there with every person that when you begin to talk about becoming right with God, it becomes a spiritual conversation that they all of a sudden are interested in. And so, so why am I telling you all this? Just to tell you about my week? No. No. I'm telling you that I watched it happen in real time, in a real situation, with people that I cared about, with people that I didn't know. But here's what happened, right? I'm going to share my last scripture with you, and I'm going to wrap it up here in a few. 1 Corinthians 12, 27 says this. All of you together are Christ's body, and each of you is a part of it. All of you are Christ's body. That's you and me. That's the people that are meeting over at First PH right now. That's the people that are meeting over at Adam's. Anybody gathered under the name of Christ is saying that you're the body of Christ. And each one of you are a part of it. What does that mean? It means by being a part of the body of Christ, I carry within me the spirit of Christ, and I carry the message of Christ, which is that he died to cover your sin and to make a way for you to be made right, to put you in right standing with God. And when I thought about sharing this, I was like, man, they don't want to hear this story. But I need you to hear the story. Because I need you to understand that no matter who you think you are, no matter how limited your ability to even communicate with people, you might be somebody who gets so nervous whenever you sit across the table from one person. I want to tell you that when you bear Christ's message, when you have the gospel, then you have the power of the Holy Spirit joining with you to do things that you could never imagine doing yourself. That when, when you sit down and you begin to share the goodness of God, the plan of God, being made right with God, you don't even really have to do anything other than just prepare a little bit, learn the story, and then let the Holy Spirit put the words right in your mouth for you. Let Him give you the wisdom what to say, when to say it, how to say it who to say it to. But I hope and I pray that after watching all this unfold, that more of us, more of us honestly, get to the point that we just kind of smile, a smile that comes from knowing kind of the big picture where we can just say, yeah, it's just what we do. It's just what we do. And as we do that, then we'll see our families. We'll see our friends, our coworkers, fellow students, strangers, waiters and waitresses, nurses and doctors, lawyers, anybody that dares come within earshot of you should be in danger of hearing the gospel, and the good news that comes through Jesus Christ. So that's my encouragement to you. Understand that there's a, a degree of pressure on you now because you now know that you're in the game. When I played basketball for one year when I was eight years old, my favorite position, <laughs> y'all think that's funny now. You didn't care about me going on vacation, but that's funny, ain't it? me playing basketball. Huh. Hmm. My favorite position was the bench. And, and you can just draw your own conclusions. It just it wasn't my sport, right? And I was so bad that my coach realized something. And he said, all right, you're going in. And I, I don't want to go in. He goes, all I want you to do this is eight now. This coach might not make it these days. He'd pick out their best player, and he'd say, you stay on him until you foul out of the game. That was my job. Foul out. It didn't take long because I was horrible. Tripping people, smacking people. But if nothing else, I was going to irritate that other eight or nine-year-old until the point they couldn't play very good anymore. 
I liked riding the bench because the bench was easy. Bunch of good guys out there, I could clap for them. Hey, man, you guys, yeah, yeah, you know, we'd get the win, I got the win. I'm on the team, right? But I wasn't so fond of it when I was in the game because I realized once I was in the game that I had at least a little bit of responsibility. And I'm here to tell you, whether you feel like it or not, the coach has called your number. You're in the game. He's saying to you that you're plan A, that you're the one. You're, he's going to make his appeal through you. So my encouragement to you is don't be afraid of that. If you're not prepared for that, let's get prepared for that. Ask for help. Tell somebody, hey, what's, what's this discipleship thing? What's this how do I tell Jesus story thing? Just ask the question. And we will help you get your game plan. As Peter says, we'll load your lip with the gospel. And then a lot of people will benefit for that. Amen. Would you stand with me? And we always give an invitation to receive Jesus as Lord and Savior. And I want to do the same thing today. You might be in the room and you're thinking, wow, nobody's ever shared that with me. Nobody's ever told me that Jesus died for my sin. Nobody ever, nobody ever told me that by him doing that, I'm forgiven and I can be made right with God. Well, I'm telling you now. And it might take a little bit of talking to help you understand what all that means, but here's what it means. God reached out to you and I when we were at our worst. He didn't require us to take a bath, to clean up, to fix our life. He just reached out to us when we were at our worst, and he said, I want to make you right with me. And you can respond to that by saying yes to him, by believing in him and trusting him and making him your Lord and Savior. If you want to do that this morning, then here's what I'd love for you to do. Just pray this prayer out loud after me. Lord Jesus, I receive your salvation. I want to know you as my Savior. I want to walk in your forgiveness, cleansed of sin, and right with God. Do that with me and for me today, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's give a hand to those people. Anybody prayed that? And if you're in the room and you prayed it, then make sure you turn to somebody right after I pray and tell them I prayed that prayer. And then make sure that that, that 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 person brings you to that corner back there so they can help you out. Guys, it's an exciting time to be alive. The world is crazy. But you have something in you that maybe you don't even realize. You have an antidote to crazy. You have an antidote to separation from God. And you have joy in such an amount that you'll be able to pass it around when you tap into it. Lord, I pray that you'll bless your people. God, help us to have your message on our lips, to, to be ambassadors for you. God, I pray that you'll help us in a real way. Watch your scriptures unfold in front of us day after day. God, we don't want to read the scriptures like they're history. Let's read them like they're today. God, you working in us through your Holy Spirit, help us to do the thing that you called us to do and that is make your appeal to other people through us. God, help us do it. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys. Thanks for being here. We'll see you soon. Oh.